Welcome to Small Arm Solutions. Today we have part five of our Colt series. This particular one is on the Colt LE series rifles. Now, the interesting thing about the LE series rifles was during the assault weapon ban, you had three different tiers. You had the military, you had law enforcement, and you had commercial. Military generally was all SBRs and, and selective fire. LE, you did have selective fire, but they were mostly uh, ones that had the pre-ban uh, characteristics such as telescopic stocks, bayonet lugs, flash suppressors, and so forth. And then you had the ban configurations, which were missing telescopic stocks, missing flash suppressors, missing bayonet lugs. So throughout the assault weapon ban, the LE series carbines were available to law enforcement military only. And then once you had the sunset of the assault weapon ban in September of 2004, LE series now were available to anybody, but there is a little bit of a snag to that. Well, first off, uh, Colt's LE series, they had specific law enforcement distributors that were set up that they would go to, and then they had the commercial distributors. So after the assault weapon ban, Colt was in the midst of their major government contracts. They weren't too interested in the commercial sales whatsoever. So for the most part, they kept their LE series, their LE series, and they kept their Commercial, the original band style. They never went from the bands, you know, the band era to the non-band era. They kept everything in the exact same configuration. They basically just claimed that, well, there's still states that have a band, so we're making them for them too. So what happened was the LE distributors would sell these guns commercially. And you would have all the LE guns that had the restricted law enforcement LE marks on them that were being sold, and it was perfectly legal. However, with Colt, the people in New York, the they were still figuring that all the LE guns were going directly to law enforcement, so it didn't raise any red flags that these guns were being sold commercially. So it sort of worked under the radar for Colt that uh, they were selling tons of LE guns, uh, making people happy, and they were keeping the you know the the shareholders uh, at bay by having them think they're still going to law enforcement instead of the commercial market. So it was sort of a it's sort of a little bit of a smokescreen, but but it worked. But unfortunately, due to the government contracts, these guns were very hard to get a hold of in the commercial and in the LE market. In fact, uh, I was at Colt in 2008 time period, 2009, and so many times that we were able to, had to tell law enforcement, we can't get you guns for up to a year uh, because the guns were, were being made, so they weren't available. But when you look at these particular models, there's a lot of interesting correlations between these and earlier earlier models. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about these as LE guns as well as after the after the ban, when they started making more of the commercial guns that were the LE configuration, the first one we're going to talk about is the AR sixty five twenty. Now, those of you who would recognize this one as the AR fifteen A two government carbine, this perhaps of all the models that Colt has is the longest serving carbine, meaning it's been in production the longest. Started probably oh, I'd say 1980, 80, 9, 88 in that time period as the AR-15A2 government carbine and then it would go right through the Colt Sporter and the Colt Sporter basically you had the exact same firearm minus the uh, the stock. Uh, the stock was a regular rifle stock that you would have in the Colt Sporter series. Uh, then in the uh, match target series you would see the same rifle minus the bayonet lug minus the uh, the flash hider it was the barrel was not was not uh, threaded, and you would see that uh, in, as a match target, and you would also see this chambered in seven sixty by thirty nine, uh, as well as a similar version in nine millimeter as well. But you would they would retain the uh, the A one style uh, sight on the, on the nine millimeter. So basically, what we have here is a if you look at the original SP one carbine, you have you had the original SP one carbine lower receiver, you had the original stock. But they changed the upper receiver was the A2 upper receiver in a 1 and 7 inch uh, barrel with the uh, compensator instead of the flash presser. This also went through a couple of different generations of lower receivers. Originally, it had the standard large pin uh, AR-1582 government model receiver. From there, it went to the uh, Colt Sporter series with the auto sear block, uh, and you had with the various different front pivot pins. This here was a later, this is a later version. Uh, I probably would put this version probably pre-2008 because around 2009 is when Colt stopped pr producing the single heat shield. Uh, they all went to the double heat shield, so anything around 2009 or so you would see uh, with the M4 type handguards. 
Uh, another thing that you'll notice that's a little bit different on these is going to be the colors. This went through the entire color schemes as well. Uh, this also was produced during the uh, Colt Sporter series as well as the Mass Target series and well into the LE series up until around 2009 using the 170 diameter uh, oversized hammer and trigger pins as well. This was a very common law enforcement gun due to the fact that it was simple. There was no batteries. There was nothing like that. It was lightweight. Um, once it was the, the sights were zeroed, you were good to go. It was simplicity. Uh, th this was probably one of the la last carbine that was ever made that was literally uh, the simplicity of a, of a basic rifle. Um, and this had always done very well in the commercial sales as well. It was it was very, very popular. This is one of the few uh, guns that there was never any kind of a military uh, look at. And the military never had anything like this. Uh, they never used the pencil barrel. Uh, they did have, you know, this was more of the uh, the XM4 type uh, with the with the uh, you know the fully adjustable rear sight and carrying handle, but uh, this one here has had a very long history, as I said, probably the longest of anything. The next one we're going to look at is the AR6721 or the Colt AR15A3 Tactical Carbine. Now, what we have here uh, is basically this uh, an M4 type carbine. You have a detachable carrying handle with a Milstein 1913 rail flat top. What's special about this one is the barrel. Instead of having a 1 in 7 inch twist government profile or pencil profile barrel, you have a 1 in 9 inch twist steel, non chrome plated, uh, 1 in 9 inch twist match barrel. Uh, everything else is pretty much the same uh, as you'd see, like on the LE6920, which we're going to talk about in a second here. Uh, this would go on to be the uh, Colt Sporter Competition H Bar 2, uh, basically of the Colt Sporter series, minus the uh, flash suppressor and bayonet lug. And, of course, minus the telescopic stock, it was basically the exact same thing. But the primary difference, again, was the heavy was the heavy match barrel. There was a 1 and 9 inch twist, and this was uh, one of the only carbines that Colt made that was a 1 and 9 inch twist. This one was not nearly as popular. Um, I, I really can't say I remember too many sales of these to law enforcement because it sort of defeated the purpose. You, want, uh, you wanted the chrome-plated barrel for corrosion resistance for being in a squad car. This probably was a more of a more of an intention of being a uh, DMR type rifle or a containment type rifle by putting an optic on here, which it definitely was capable of doing. Uh, the one nine inch twist uh, at the time this came out, it was when there was a lot of use of the sixty nine grain ammunition, not the seventy seven. Uh, the seventy seven grain ammunition really wouldn't come into play until well into the global war on terror, uh, and this and this rifle was available uh, way prior to uh, the global war on terror. It was made right up until the very end as well, just not nearly the uh, the quantity. But uh, very accurate rifle, very dependable rifle, everything that you'd want. But uh, as I said, this is more of a DMR containment rifle than a, than a patrol carbine. Perhaps the most popular of all time carbine a Colt ever produced was the LE6920. Now, the LE6920 came out in 1998. Uh, the, in 1998, the M4 carbine came out in 1995. Basically, what the LE6920 was, a semi-automatic legal version of the M4 carbine that was semi-automatic with a 16-inch barrel. So basically, what you had was a U.S. government M4 with a 16-inch barrel, and it was semi-automatic only. And this was undoubtedly the most in-demand and the most popular of, of, of all time for Colt. This particular one here, uh, I have had modified, obviously. I have the M4 Raz on here. Um, I had put on there just because of the fact that's how these left Colt uh, for the U.S. military. They had the Montec backup site. These left in a couple different ways. They had the M4 uh, double heat shield handguards. The early rifles came with a detachable carrying handle, like you saw in the Air 15 3 Tactical. Uh, and those, again, those were just a waste of money because people would rip them right off and they would put optics on them. And Colt eventually would go to selling just the backup site for the U.S. government. They would stop with the carrying handles. All of them came with the Montec backup sight. And then eventually the uh, the LE guns uh, were the same thing. They would have backup sights on them. But you'd see Montec, you'd see Magpul, you'd see some different types of uh, backup sights that came on those. You had the full range of lower receivers, um, but you always had uh, the push pin. You, you never had any of the any of the ones where you had the screw and collet or whatnot. You always had an M4 type lower receiver. You started off with a 170 diameter hammer and trigger pin, and then around the 2009 period is when they got rid of the over, oversized trigger, hammer and trigger pins and went back to the original mill spec. Uh, you always had the mill spec stock on them. Uh, you always had the 1 and 7 inch chrome line barrel, government profile, F mark front sight base. Um, Throughout uh, throughout the years of this is production, and you go after the assault weapon ban, after that stopped, these were sold, and then Colt finally got off their ass and started producing a commercial version. And you'll see those, they'll say M4 on the side instead of law enforcement carbine. You'll see 
um, Colt's mortar on the side. You'll see a couple different ways they were marked, but the final way was M4 carbine. And basically what Colt did was they sold these in any different, which way you can, you can want. It'd be the exact same rifle, Magpul furniture, green, black, tan, uh, whether it had the, their SOCOM models where you would, it would come with uh, a Troy handguard or it would come with the, the actual Knight's RAS. You would have ones that would come with, um, you know, you know, various types of stocks, um, some would have pre-floated handguards on them, but it was the exact same base model. And those would go right up through the very end uh, of Colts pulling these guns from production. But uh, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that this was a, the all-time bestseller of Colts' entire carbine line. Um, you couldn't, you know, now they're commanding a very large uh, amount of money due to the fact that Colts no longer no longer producing them. I can remember selling these and uh, doing demos for law enforcement for these. These were these were the most common law enforcement carbine that we had sold as well. Uh, they were semi-automatic. A lot of law enforcement agencies uh, wanted semi-automatic. They didn't want to go through the NFA paperwork. And for a patrol officer, generally, you didn't want them to have fully automatic. You only pretty much get that to SWAT anyways. This was the number one rifle uh, you know, of all time for Colt for, for law enforcement. Next one we're going to look at is the AR-6540 Colt 9mm carbine. Now, as we go back in time to the, oh, I would say 80... 86, 87, was when Colt introduced their uh, 9mm carbine rifle, which had the A1 sight on it, the narrow handguards. Uh, that would go in production well uh, into, well, that went right up until the end as well, uh, that model. This was the first time it was really updated. Uh, and basically the only update was a flat top upper receiver on the 9mm carbine. You can see we went to the uh, M4 type handguards on here, flat top, came with a Magpul uh, backup sight. These also came with the stainless steel hammer and trigger pins that were required for the 9mm. You can see we have the gas deflector. This was added a couple of years later after the introduction in 86. A lot of people like to think of this as a uh, cartridge case deflector. It is not. It's designed to prevent unburned propellant from hitting a left-handed person in the face. Um, this was the final evolution of the 9mm carbine. Of course, you had in the LE versions, you did have the you know the 105 inch versions. Um, you did have some different different variations, selected fire and so forth. But um, this was the final iteration uh, of the 9mm carbine that Colt would produce. But you still would see the A1 carrying handle as well. Um, for law enforcement, the 9mm at the time of the M4 came out, the 9mm was on the outs. Uh, law enforcement, um, this was originally designed for law enforcement. Uh, it was designed for a lot of foreign customers. It was designed to compete with the MP5 and, uh, and various submachine guns. Uh, however, in the United States... The 9mm dropped from existence and everything went to 5.56 of the M4 type carbines. Now, overseas, these definitely were sold overseas. Uh, these were sold in Jamaica. They were sold in uh, a lot of Middle Eastern countries where they still felt that the 9mm was a viable caliber. Um, to my surprise, that uh, it's, it's taken them a long time to switch over to the 5.56 and get rid of the 9mm, but it, it never, never really went away. This was a... I don't want to say it was as much of a success for Colt uh, because of the fact that they never really finished the design. Uh, we had seen this, uh, I had seen this over in uh, Jamaica and a couple other places where I had done, in India, where I had done demonstrations uh, for, for law enforcement and military over there where we had malfunctions. We had issues because Colt never really finished it. Uh, it wasn't really until around 2009 when uh, we had some issues in India that uh, Colt finally started uh, making some making some changes. And this has all of those changes that were involved. If you're interested in those changes, we do have a video on the 9mm uh, carbine 9mm submachine gun. As we previously discussed, the LE-6920 was introduced in 1998, I believe it was. And this would be the first gun since 1998 to be put into production and released, and that would be in 2009, the LE-6940, their upper receiver. Now, this had existed uh, up till around 2000, oh, I would say around 2006, uh, because the SCAR program, uh, the Types A and Type C SCARs, utilized the one-piece upper receiver. So these guns were at Colt there, ready to go from 2006, but they were not released until 2009. This, I believe, is Colt's crown jewel. I believe this is the M4's finest hour uh, with this upper receiver. Uh, we have a full free-floated barrel. You have QD points on the sides. You have 1913 rails, a folding front sight base. You have a standard government profile barrel. Um, well, unfortunately, one thing to be noted about this was uh, this was a violation of Carl Lewis's patent for his monolithic upper receiver, so Colt had to pay uh, royalties and pay a penalty for it. Um, you know, again, knowing the engineers at Colt who did this, 
I don't believe they copied him. I didn't believe they did it on their own, but, their, but the lawyers at Colt uh, did not do their due diligence and do a patent search and find out this was done uh, before. And unfortunately, parallel development does happen. The first ones, actually, I sent out uh, you know, when I was at Colt. Uh, I was there when this, this happened. This was released, and I released this to five or six writers. The first ones had the standard uh, law enforcement government carbine uh, lower receivers. They had, you know, restricted marks on it. They were 170 diameter hammer and trigger pens. Uh, they did come with an ambi safety on them, the, the initial ones. And when they went into production, uh, they they still kept these receivers, the lower uh, receivers that were marked law enforcement government use only. And once uh, Colt started getting into their own commercial, they switched over to the, you know, the commercial M4 marked lower receivers with the 155 di diameter hammer and trigger pens. Uh, had gone through that iteration. Now, these were offered to law enforcement with various barrel lengths, 14 and a half inch, uh, 16 inch, uh, 11 and a half inch, uh, 10.3 inch. They were offered in various uh, different uh, barrel lengths as SBRs and, of course, selective fire models as well. Uh, these often came with either the Montec backup sight or they would come with the uh, the Magpul backup sight, depending on what the time period was. Uh, this particular one I have more set up like the SCAR uh, that they put, they put out uh, where it has the the Otis clean kit in the bottom, Ambi features, it has the uh, Ambi mag release, and it had the uh, Voltor stock on it. It also come with a Roger stock as well. Um, this probably wasn't nearly as, as popular as it could have been due to the fact that Colt had to pay royalties on it. Um, and once you saw the, uh, once that lawsuit what came through and Colt had to pay, which unfortunately also was Dimaco Colt Canada, they, their IUR was also a violation, you didn't see as many of these because Colt obviously didn't, didn't want to pay Carl Lewis money. But... Uh, to me, in my opinion, this, this is literally the M4's finest hour. This is the finest M4 that Colt uh, had produced. The next model we're going to talk about is probably the unicorn of all of the models that, you, that we've discussed. This is the LE6940P, or piston gun. Now, this was a derivative that came out of the uh, SCAR program. The Type C SCAR was an external piston. And throughout the global war on terror and throughout all the controversies of there's a better gun and you can't have it, uh, HK showing their 416 and so forth, Colt had an external piston gun that's gone through a few different developments that went from the uh, Type-C SCAR to the LE-1020 to the LE-6940 advanced piston carbine, which is what you see here. Colt did not introduce this until well after 2000, oh, I'd say 2011, 2012 in that area, in that era. Uh, Colt felt by introducing this to the to sales that they were showing or admitting that they had something better than their M4 carbine, which was a complete wrong way to look at it. They had customers who wanted external piston rifles. They said, no, good enough for the U.S. government, good enough for you, you want direct gas. So what did those customers do? They went to H&K, they went to LWRC, they went to people who would give it to them. So Colt basically to try to try to convince everybody what they had was better and not introduce this, they gave that business to somebody else. Where in reality is you give your customer what they want. Regardless of what you think is better, if your customer tells you they want an external piston, that's what you give them. Well, Colt released very few of these to the commercial market, the LE market. Very, very few. Um, they are to this date probably the biggest unicorn of all of them. It's an excellent rifle. It's very well made. It's a reliable rifle. Too little, too late. And then to sort of add insult to injury to the commercial market, Colt stopped producing them for commercial sales. They're only available for military sales now. Um, so a lot of you guys out there who have these, who want spare parts, you know, if you have anything for the gas system, good luck getting it because uh, they're not selling any of the spare parts for it, unfortunately. Um, this rifle could have made Colt a lot of money uh, in the commercial market. People wanted it, but uh, it's one that they didn't sell. Um, and it was it was quite sad. But uh, any of you guys who are looking for for collector's models, if you come across these, these, these are collector's rifles. What we have here is the AR-15A4 government carbine, AR-6720. Basically what we have here is an updated version of the AR-15A2 government carbine. We have the exact same rifle with a flat top upper receiver. So we took the pencil barrel, we took the front sight, we took everything that was about this rifle and modernized it with the M4 feed ramps, we modernized it with a flat top upper receiver. Now, I got to say something about the AR-15A4 name. That is not Colt. Um, I always believe in giving credit to where credit is due. In 2008, um, many of you guys have known the name Ken Elmore. Ken Elmore is the uh, owner of Specialized Armament Warehouse. He, had, he decided he wanted to get a commercial version of the, a, of the M16A4. So what he did was he came up with a bill of materials, 
uh, and he presented it to Colt with the drawings of a AR-15A4 logo on the left-hand side, which means all Colt had to do was to take a, a government upper receiver and you know slap it onto a standard lower receiver with a with a stock on it and put the markings on it. So he had AR-15A4. He had everything on there. Well, the Head of marketing looked at it and said, no one's going to tell us uh, how to mark our rifles and told him no. Even though that Ken had, he had, I think it was like, uh, he had well over a million and a half. He, he had a lot of money that he had secured to produce, I don't know how many hundred rifles and how many hundred uh, of the upper receivers alone. So Colt refused it. So that is where AR-15A4 came from. It was not Colt. It was anybody else. It was Ken Elmore. So this was the updated version. Uh, this this didn't come out until probably the... I probably would say mid mid 2000s 2015 2016 in that area. Uh, it was around maybe a little bit earlier than that is when this came out. But uh, again, what we have here is a modernized version of the AR-15A2 government model. The next one we're going to look at is a highly modified version of what Colt introduces the AR-15A4 government model rifle. This is exactly what Ken had in mind when he wanted the AR-15A4. However, the rifle that Colt introduced. Uh, this is basically that rifle, but many, many modifications. This normally uh, had just come with the standard M16A2 round handguards. I had added the uh, M5 RAS to it. I added the uh, ACOG to it, which is what the Marine Corps used. This did come with a detachable carrying handle. I added the Montec sight to it. And of course, I had also added the UID label and the slings and whatnot. Now, the rifle that Colt introduced was not an exact copy of the M16A4. Uh, the rifle, uh, although that's what its intent was, they had several of the updated features. For instance, um, many of them did not have the F-Mark front sight base. So my guess was is they found a whole bunch of M16A2 barrels, uh, and they threw them on there, and they didn't have the proper front sight bases on them. So that's one of the things that you have to take a look at when you buy these rifles, if they have that or not. Number two was the feed ramp on the upper receiver and the barrel extension. The upper receivers that are used on the Colt AR-15A4 are not M16A4 upper receivers, meaning uh, the M16A4 upper receivers do not have feed ramps. These do. This is a standard M4 upper receiver. The barrel extension. Barrel extension on an M16A2A4 does not have extended feed ramps on the barrel extension. This one does. So those were the two major differences on the AR-15A4 AR rifle was, was the checking out, make sure you had the proper front sight base, and it was the, uh, the, you know, the upper receiver being an M4. However, this was a very popular rifle. This sold very, very well. Everybody would always ask me, uh, I get emails all the time, if I want to get the closest thing to a, to a U.S. government M16A4, should I get this or should I get the FN? Well, the reality, this. Because this one, this rifle here has the actual CMP556801-7 on the barrel. This one has a C-marked bolt carrier, an MPC-marked uh, bolt, bolt. It has all the U.S. government mil-spec parts on it, which, which are properly marked. It has a C-marked upper receiver. Now, you look at the FN, the FN does not have any of the FN marks on it because it can't, because that's, that's U.S. government TDP, they can't do that. So you have a configuration, but all those fine details that some of us look at, uh, the Colt was definitely the only way to go. But uh, I was very pleased to see this rifle came out. Uh, I wish Ken would have got a little bit more credit because this was what he wanted way back when. Uh, this was something else that would Colt was too little too late. People had asked for this for quite some time. They wanted something that was uh, the same as the A, you know, the A4. Colt stopped making the A2s quite some time ago, but this rifle was long, long, in, you know, it waited for, but unfortunately it came too late. The last rifle that we're going to go over is the LE 901 16S, and I gotta say I think this is truly a travesty uh, because the rifle had this rifle had so much potential, but it was too late. In fact, I talked to a friend of mine who is a, he was a uh, he's former Navy SEAL. And he worked on the SCAR program uh, back around the 2006 time period. And he had said that if Colt would have introduced this rifle in 2006, they would have bought it. Because it had the ability to switch from 308 to 556. It was a universal rifle. Uh, this, was, this concept came right from General Keys. General Keys just came out and told engineering, I want a rifle that will be convertible from 308 to 556, which is what we have here. Uh, this was developed by uh, a former Colt guy named Larry Robbins. Uh, this guy was a true genius, uh, mechanical genius. He's probably one of the best gun designers that's probably still out there right now. But what we had here was a 308 rifle. Now, what we see here is a grounds-up rifle. Uh, this does not have any parts interchangeability with anything else that's out there. It has a proprietary bolt, bolt carrier, uh, everything. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was designed because of its interchangeability. Very, very accurate rifle. I would not give, I would not put this in line with a sniper rifle. It was not that accurate. This is, I think, far better as an assault rifle. The rifle that you see here would have been ideal for our troops in Afghanistan. 
You had you had the original ones were safe semi-auto. Uh, they had the ability to get the extended ranges that were required uh, over in Afghanistan. Um, you had 25-round magazines. This would have been an ideal rifle for Afghanistan, uh, the way that it was built. But, unfortunately, Colt came out with it too little, too late. And, unfortunately, also, these are no longer available. Uh, Colt stopped uh, manufacturing them prior to their uh, announcement of no longer making guns for the commercial market. Now, this rifle here uh, also fell to Carl Lewis's patent, uh, so Colt had to pay royalties on this one as well. Uh, Colt, after that, went to what they called the Mark Series. Uh, Mark Series mostly used uh, two-piece receivers, so they didn't have to pay that extra amount of money. It did utilize standard SR-25 type magazines. It was ambidextrous. Um, it did have folding front sight base. It made use of the Smith Enterprises Vortex Flash Hider, which I believe is the best flash hider in the industry. Um, it's been tested and proven. Uh, in fact, I tested it myself uh, in dark with a camera. Compared to other ones, I think they're the best ones that are out there, so they went with that. Proven Voltor stock, ambidextrous uh, safety as well. And again, the neat thing about this was it made it had the ability to swap upper to lower receiver. We do have a video on this one as well that goes over it in extreme detail. So if you're interested, in, go see that video. Um, the conversion was made by a block that would uh, lock onto the upper receiver that would fit into the receiver here. It will allow you to take standard 5.56 magazines uh, in the lower receiver. You change out the buffer as well. But uh, I'm very fond of this rifle, very, very well made. You know, there's a lot of designs that Colt had that were excellent designs that it was a failure on the marketing uh, and the sales end of it. Um, this was one of them. The uh, CK901 was one of them. Uh, the 9mm was one of them. The Colt Mars program was one of them. Uh, these were where you had truly excellent products that had a lot of sales potential, but they were stopped by the sales and marketing department. Now, there were some other guns as well. You had Colt Combat Unit, you had uh, Colt Patrol Carbines, and, and, and so forth, which we don't, we don't have those here today. Uh, There's only a few guns that were really made uh, after the, sun, the, you know, the Sunset Band over the last several years. Uh, you know, once Colt lost their government contracts, they spent a little bit more time paying attention to what the commercial market wanted. The Colt Combat Unit, um, I had done a review on that one. I would definitely recommend you check that one out. That was the first time I thought that they really listened to the customer, giving them an intermediate gas system. Uh, they went with the mid-length gas system on that. They went with a beautiful uh, Centurion Arms rail. Uh, the Centurion Arms rails are excellent they, when they partner up with them. Uh, you had other ones where they had different stocks, and you had a lot of Magpul stuff and so forth. Um, you only really had a couple of rifles that they had done. They'd also farmed their name out to a Colt Competition, uh, which had nothing to do with Colt guns. It was just a, they, they, you know, it was a Colt Expanse and that abortion stuff um, and you had seen uh, them sell some of the receivers uh, Colt for the first time sold parts um, you know if you, look, if, you, if you look at those guns that came out in those early years the original sporter ones you could never find Colt parts uh, Colt didn't sell them um, it wasn't until after the loss of the government contract where you started seeing Brownells uh, stock up on tons of Colt parts and upper receivers and so on and so forth. That was the first time those parts were available. And, of course, that was successful, too. If you go try to find parts on Brownells for a Colt right now, they're gone. You know, the parts were always top selling. So there's always a potential there to make money for the company. Um, they just chose not to do it. Um, so, you know, the guns are very, you know, all Colt guns now, I guess you could say they have collector's value because they're no longer made. You have uh, SP1s that are uh, about ready to make the Curio and Relics uh, because of being 50 years old. The Colt guns that you had seen over these last several videos was just the evolution of the weapons platform. You had an evolution of variations, uh, updates in, in components, updates uh, for government contracts. And then you saw sort of a, a down curve uh, after they lost their contract where the parts weren't being made in-house. You know, you didn't have barrels that were made by Colt. You didn't have receivers that were made at Colt. You didn't have the bolt carrier groups. Where you had prior to that, you had full production lines of bolts, bolt carriers, barrels that were at Colt, which the quality was astronomical. Uh, you know, Colt, one thing nobody can ever take away from Colt is they are probably one of the most successful mass producers of incredible quality firearms in, in this country. Uh, what they were able to produce, their lack was always in engineering. You know, after the after the SCAR program, after the SCAR program, the engineering pretty much dropped off, uh, and then, you know, the new products were not there. But um, I hope you guys enjoyed this entire series. Um, it gave you really good detail on what changes there were, when the changes were, um, from from the beginning of the production of this rifle in the '60s uh, right up to right up to today. Now, I'm sure there's models that we don't have here. You know, I don't have access to all of them, but uh, I got through to you all the the biggest ones that we had. 
I have some call-outs as well. Uh, Brandon at the gun room in Shenandoah, Texas, for loaning, loaning weapons. We also had a couple of our viewers, too, who loaned us rifles, the AR-15A2 government model, the AR-15A4 uh, carbine. Uh, we have several rifles over loaned to us uh, by you guys, so we want to thank you guys for that as well. That really adds to all of this when I have uh, the firearms to show. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you do, please click like, please subscribe, and even better share. Thank you.